Hello and welcome to the channel. Today, I'd like to say goodbye to Victor Belenko. Victor passed away in September 2023, and may he rest in peace. And I'd like to say thank you, Victor, for stealing that MIG. You see, back in 1976, Victor was one of the most spectacular, well, actually, he was the most spectacular defector, apart from some Olympic people, but Victor stole a brand new MiG-25 jet and flew it to Japan from Vladivostok, Russia. Victor was a young Air Force officer. In 76, he was 29 years old, and he had been trained to fly fighter jets. During August and September of 1976, he was transitioning to the, the new MiG-25 Super Interceptor. This was Russia's fastest plane. I think it still is Russia's fastest plane. This is one of the most spectacular aircraft of the time that was produced. And at the time, the West knew very, very little about the aircraft. Victor brought one and handed it over to the West. It was really quite a big deal. Victor's defection can be described as more of an escape. Victor was on a training exercise on the 6th of September when he took off at 12.20 in the afternoon from Vladivostok, Russia. And he was with two or three other aircraft on a training exercise. It's unclear. Um, I, I find many different reports on all this stuff. I read as many as I can. And there's often discrepancies. And it's one of the things that kind of makes research interesting. But one report says he was with two planes. The other report says he's, he was with three. When Russian aircraft arrive in their training areas, they do a 360 clearing turn before they begin any of their exercises, probably for safety. Sounds like a good idea. Victor did his 360, and then he pushed that aircraft down to the ground, and he screamed along to the coast, and he got the heck out of Russia. He was right down on the water, and he threw a couple of switches there. He made an emergency beacon go off, and he made it look like he crashed. And he turned off all his radios shortly after, and he screamed along very low to the water um, below any radar capabilities. The aircraft burns an awful lot of fuel down there, as do most jets. And after a little while, he knew he had to climb up to altitude to save fuel, and so he'd have some range and get to Japan. So he went up to 19,000 feet and started cruising along. At that point, he triggered the radar of Japan's defense radar, and Japan knew something was coming, and they scrambled two F-4 Phantoms to intercept him. This is actually what Victor wanted to have happen, because Japan was obscured by cloud, as it often is, and you can't see airports when you're up in the sky and the clouds obscure the ground. So how would you land a jet? He really wanted to be intercepted and led to the airport. But that didn't happen, and he had, he was keeping track of time, so he knew when he would cross the coast. So before he did that, he dived it back down to the water, and he got under 3,000 feet below the clouds, and he was screaming along, and he hit the coast, and he turned right. He went south. Well, not too much longer after that, he bumped into a civilian airport at Hakodat. Hakodat is on the northern island of Hokkaido, Japan, and I hope I pronounce that properly. Here's where th the reports are different again. There was a civilian airliner taking off. It was a Boeing 727, and it took off and left the area. The first report, uh, well, one report I read, said that he sort of went around that airplane and landed on the runway, it was going way too fast, and went off the end of the runway. Another report says that he did a circle over the city and came back around to land and was nowhere near the Boeing that was taking off. Another report said that he did two circles over the city and then came in and land. So I think the circling of the city is true for sure because there's two really great photographs of him flying um, over the city. And the, the, this is the actual photograph right here. This is the, and, and it really looks like he was low. One thing for sure, here's, there's two photographs. One thing for sure is that this would have been the loudest thing that anybody would have ever heard at this little town of Hadako. Um, military aircraft are extremely loud, and this thing was the loudest of them all. It had two massive jet engines, and I'm sure they were making just hordes of noise as this thing was circling around and coming into land. Victor said he touched down at about 220 knots, and that wasn't enough to get the jet stopped on the runway. 
runway was not long enough. He did deploy his parachute, but he did roll off the end of the runway at some speed, went a couple of hundred meters past the runway, through the mud, mowed over a couple of antennas that were um, antennas that are for the runway's uh, instrument approach system. But then the aircraft came skidding to a stop, and of all things, there was a construction crew there that was in um, a civic work works project of extending the runway. Pretty much all airports were getting extended through the 70s as jet aircraft were taking over and jets need uh, more room. Victor opened his canopy and he stood up and of all things he brandished a pistol and fired off two shots in the air. He was trying to get people not to take pictures of, of his airplane. He was trying to act like he was trying to protect it. He told people later in an interview that that was all an act that he was worried that the Japanese officials might send him back to Japan and he wanted to make it look like he was protecting the airplane, that everything was an accident and he was really just a good Soviet young pilot. When Japanese officials got to him, he asked for asylum in the United States. They didn't really know what to do with him, so they took him to a police department and nearby and they interrogated him for a while or talked to him or fed him or whatever they did. I'm sure language was a bit of a problem. And then they put him in a hotel that night and brought him back to the police department the next day. Actually, I think he had to go to court. He was charged with four, they actually formally charged him so that they had some sort of excuse for holding him because the Russians were screaming for him right away. Within a couple of days, he was in American custody and he jumped onto a 747 jet and headed to Washington, D.C. via Los Angeles. There's some pretty great footage of him being put on the airplane, and it sure looks like he got a fancy suit from his American handlers. Meanwhile, back at the airport, the airplane, they had to move it off the mud and get it over towards the terminal. And they discovered that the front wheels, both the tires were, were shot. He had he'd wrecked them on bringing them in. But they discovered that the front tires were exactly the same size as the tire on a Jeep. So they fixed the front flat tires, and they, uh, I don't know if they towed it or I have one report that says that a crane lifted it up and put it onto the tarmac. And that's believable because the thing's really heavy and it would have sunk in the mud. And you can't tow something along that's sunk in the mud or you snap the landing gear off. That's been proven hundreds of times. So they did get it onto the ramp there. They covered it with tarps. And then in some days later, they built uh, sort of walls of scaffolding around it, covered it with wood and made it sort of like a a little building to put it in. At that point, they began to take the thing apart. On September 24th, it fit inside a U.S. Air Force C-5 Galaxy cargo airplane, and they moved it to a U.S. air base near Tokyo. At that point, the whole thing went inside a hangar, and nobody saw it again until it was inside a crates. And Again, the reports differ. One report says it was loaded into 16 crates. Another says 25. Another says 30. It's hard to get a complete picture of what happened to that MiG inside the hangar. But they did take it apart. They did run engines. And they did run the radar system. Interesting report I read from the Russians. They said that there was a couple of components inside the radar's electronics that had been replaced Obviously, things had gone wrong while they were testing it. They probably tested it quite vigorously, and they blew up a couple things, like a little re resistor, maybe an SCR, but I heard resistor and something else, and they had to desolder that and, and, and put some Western products in. So the Russians knew it had been operated, tampered with, broken, and repaired. Additionally, he didn't land with very much fuel, but again, the reports are different. One report says the aircraft had 14 tons of fuel and it landed with three. So that's 6,000 pounds of fuel, which is like, that's about eight barrels of fuel. And the one report I read said they defueled the aircraft before they transported it. They kept the fuel. And when they tested the engines, they used that fuel. Apparently, the fuel that Russians use is quite different from Western fuel. It's not the same at all and the engine was built to run off this one type of fuel. Another report says that he only had 52 gallons of fuel when he landed, which is about one big drum. And that's shocking because that would be like only a minute or so, maybe a couple of minutes of fuel flying that thing at low altitude. That's pretty scary. But some reports did say that, and but that doesn't substantiate that they would have been able to test run the engine, the engines 
one or both of the engines. They probably just did one. But they do have measurements on, on the power of the thing. The construction of the airplane did not impress anyone who, who inspected it. It's sort of a rude construction. There were, it's made of steel. There's titanium on the leading edges of the wings, but most of the rest of the airplane is completely steel. There's weld, there's a lot of welding, and some of the welds weren't even, like on the exterior of the airplane, they weren't even ground down flush. They, if it wasn't in a high pressure zone, it wasn't really cared for. Very different from Western high performance jets that are completely flush, riveted, and very well made. Victor went on to a long life in the United States. He married again, he had two sons, and he didn't have to work. He had a trust fund that allowed him to sustain himself modestly for the rest of his life. He also helped any contractors that asked. He, he worked with the US government and anybody who needed information on Russia and Soviet activities. As the years passed, that probably wasn't all that important again. And, and a great little side note to the story is that after the Soviet Union fell apart in, 19, in the early 1990s, he actually traveled to Russia in 1995 and he visited and had no problems. And he, I don't know what he did there, but he visited it. <laughs> Maybe he wanted to see relatives. I don't know. But he was there and he was allowed to leave. <laughs> he came back and he passed away in America on September 24th of 23. And hope you rest in peace, Victor. That's a very interesting life you must have had. So what happened to the jet? Well, all the crates were taken by road down to a port and put on a freighter, a Russian freighter king, and picked up all the crates. They got a little inspection before they left and away they went. And the aircraft went back to Russia. There's a few reports, and now we're looking at the Russian reports. The aircraft was never flown again. It was taken to a school. It was reassembled, and they discovered all the pieces of it that was missing. They said there was about 20 pieces missing. They all they discovered the repaired radar pieces, and they knew the engines had been run. They were really quite miffed. They decided never to fly the plane. They had it at a school, and they were using it for training, ground training, or whatever they were doing. And then... Currently, there's a whole line of MiGs in front of the Sokolo, Sokoi, oh, I'm pronouncing this wrong, but there's a, a sort of outdoor museum in a big, long string outside a building in Russia, and there's one of all the different MiGs built in that lineup. And the MiG-25, it, well, all of the aircraft have, the numerals on the airplane are the numbers of what they are. And if you look at this picture here, you can see the MiG-21 on the left and the MiG-25 five on the right. Well, that MiG-25 used to say 31 right there. <laughs> we think that that is, that's Victor Belanco's jet. Low hours. The plant is not far from the center of Moscow. And over the years, this place has manufactured over 13,500 combat aircraft. Uh, that's a lot. Almost 1,200 MiG-25s were built. And the MiG-31 is basically it's sort of the modern version of a MiG-25. It's a very similar aircraft. They look quite the same, actually. If you like this little story, please hit subscribe, and I'll try and make some more.